Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. And today I'm going to be covering Buspirone, which the brand name of this medication is Buspar. Uh, its generic kind of classification is an anti-anxiety type medication. And I would say in clinical practice, that's probably the most uh, common reason you're, you're going to see this medication utilized. Uh, on occasion, uh, I rarely have seen it used uh, for depression as far as augmentation and using it with uh, other antidepressant agents in patients who are uh, struggling to get those uh, symptoms under control. Uh, but I would say that's uh, pretty uh, rare there in general. So with buspirone, the mechanism of action is really not totally well understood as far as uh, its role in uh, managing and, and helping anxiety symptoms. Now, there is some uh, th- theories, some suggested uh, mechanism of actions that we, we might think uh, that this medication works through. Uh, so when you think of a medication that might work for depression, might work for anxiety, we probably think of uh, serotonergic activity. So that's one of the, the main mechanisms <clears throat> that our uh, educated guess or best guess uh, is that it is a, a partial agonist at 5-HT1 uh, receptors, uh, potentially 5-HT2 as well. So having that agonist stimulating type activity, uh, you might hypothesize that's the reason why we may see some uh, anti-anxiety, anti-depressant uh, type benefit with this medication. Now, there is one other uh, suggested mechanism that it does have some mild uh, dopamine blocking activity. So I'll talk about that a little bit as far as um, adverse effect profile and kind of a rare situation uh, that you you may come up against. With dosing, uh, I think one of the bigger downsides with buspirone Uh, is that it's got a very short half-life. And so this medication is dosed generally two to three times per day. So in patients where you've got difficulty with adherence, uh, maybe a very busy schedule, that type of thing, um, asking a patient to take a medication um, two or even three times a day uh, can be a little bit more challenging. So that's definitely uh, more of a disadvantage uh, with this type of medication. One other uh, disadvantage uh, is kind of similar to, let's let's say, the SSRIs. These uh, buspirone takes a while to work. So you're not generally going to get, get that instant relief of anxiety. You know, it's going to take generally a few weeks to really um, start to, to show some benefit in most cases there. So uh, that can definitely be a downside. Uh, advantages of buspirone compared to, you know, other anti-anxiety medications like uh, benzodiazepines, for example. So uh, tolerability, uh, buspirone is generally very well tolerated, uh, and particularly uh, in our elderly population, uh, we don't really run the risk of many active metabolites or or those type of issues. Um, So that can be really a beneficial thing. Uh, when we compare uh, buspirone maybe to uh, benzodiazepines, for example, which uh, we should know that you know benzodiazepines have a ton of nasty side effects in geriatric patients, from you know fall risk to sedation to confusion, uh, and so on and so forth. There, uh, another advantage, uh, again, kind of using that comparison of benzodiazepines, is that buspirone. Uh, is not a controlled substance. So, you know, risk of addiction, dependence, uh, really isn't there quite like it is uh, for the, the benzos. So uh, just some, some good comparisons, I think, to, to remember with uh, buspirone there and, you know, why it might be advantageous to use that medic- this medication or why it, you know, might not work in certain situations a- as well. Uh, adverse effect profile, again, usually pretty well tolerated, at least in, in my experience from what I've seen 
uh, keep an eye out for any medication that kind of works in the brain and, and works on those receptors, um, looking out for any CNS changes, you know, whether it's uh, dizziness, sedation, confusion, uh, those type of things. Uh, maybe some mild GI adverse effects, but, you know, it's it's nothing major, you know, not you know, if you, if you compare it to, you know, metformin and other drugs that have, you know, well-known uh, ability to cause GI upset, it, it's definitely nowhere near uh, that type of uh, frequency. Now, a couple of things that I did want to mention that kind of tie into the uh, purported mechanism of action. So, serotonin agonist activity, um, there is uh, potential, you'll see precautions, uh, drug interactions, things of that nature for serotonin syndrome. So your SSRIs, your TCAs, and, and so on and so forth, um, that could be a cumulative type effect. Again, this is uh, clinical reasoning, looking at the patient, are we using high doses, um, you know, have they had a history of, of serotonin syndrome or something in the past, um, assessing that patient clinically, and other medications that they're on can really help us determine, okay, is this likely going to be a significant issue or something we need to monitor closely, or is it not going to be uh, that big a deal? Uh, the other one, uh, there have been cases of uh, pseudo-Parkinson's-type symptoms, akesthesia, that, those type of symptoms, movements, uh, disorders. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, if you maybe have an happen to have a patient on, um, you know, cinnamon for Parkinson's, for example, or if you're on other dopamine blocking agents, you know, antipsychotics, things of that nature, you, you could potentially get a little bit of an additive effect. And again, it, it's kind of got this potentially weak dopamine blockade, and that may lead uh, to an increased incidence of those uh, movement disorders. Again, I haven't seen this in clinical practice personally, um, but there is some uh, literature out there, case reports and things of that, uh, like that, um, that, that may indicate that this is at least possible. So something to think about. Again, something that's not very common at all. Uh, from a kinetics perspective, uh, the short half-life I mentioned, we need frequent dosing with this medication, uh, unfortunately. Uh, there is a very high uh, first-pass metabolism with buspirone as well. Uh, so I think that's uh, just an important thing to note there. So let's take a quick break here from our sponsor, and then we'll get into drug interactions after the break. If you're a pharmacist in the market for board certification study material, whether it be NAPLEX, BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, or medication therapy management certification, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. In addition, we've got other professional resources as well. So if you're a you know, nurse, physician, student in, in any field that requires uh, medication education, pharmacology, things of that nature, um, we do have uh, a couple of books on Audible, which you can actually get your first one for free uh, if you've never tried Audible. So definitely a, a cool little perk there. You can get six to eight hours of uh, case studies and drug interactions and, and good clinical discussion. Uh, within one of those books. Again, you find that link uh, along with all the other resources we have at meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. Now, finishing up on drug interactions, uh, buspirone, I would say there there is definitely potential uh, for a significant number of drug interactions. Uh, the clinical relevance and, and how significant um, that is, is is maybe a little bit up for de debate. So, buspirone is broken down by CYP3A4, okay? So, that's ultimately going to lead to a lot of potential drugs that could uh, impact that 3A4 enzyme and raise or lower concentrations of, of buspirone, respectively. So, if you've got a CYP3A4 inhibitor, uh, just keep an eye out. Look out for, you know, signs and symptoms of adverse effects, toxicity, uh, from buspirone, uh, so your classic 3A4 inhibitors, uh, grapefruit juice, some of the calcium channel blockers, 
um, some of the, the macrolide antibiotics like clarithromycin, uh, azole antifungals. So those are just some, some good uh, examples of drugs that can uh, inhibit CYP3A4 and could raise concentrations of buspirone. Now, if you've got an inducer on board, uh, carbamazepine, a St. John's wort, things of that nature, that could potentially reduce or lower concentrations of buspirone. So in that setting, you might see a patient that's had their anxiety very well controlled on buspirone. Maybe we start one of these inducers, and now all of a sudden they're not controlled anymore because the concentrations have been uh, lowered there by this type of drug interaction. So just think about some of those uh, medications and remember that uh, 3A4 is a player with buspirone and that we're going to probably in most situations uh, clinically monitor that patient. And then of course the, the other drug interaction I really wanted to point out was the serotonergic activity um, where this drug does potentially have some uh, serotonin agonist activity. So any drug that's going to raise serotonin, your tramadols, your SSRIs, SNRIs, uh, we do uh, have that uh, theoretical risk, however low that may be, uh, depending upon that uh, patient uh, clinical situation. So that's going to wrap it up for today. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you enjoy the, the podcast, uh, you'll definitely enjoy, enjoy the free resource from reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, it's a 31-page PDF of the top 200 drugs, and I pick out the most important pearls that you need to know. So a really ideal resource for uh, somebody going through pharmacology classes, for example, um, and that's ultimately free. Great resource for uh, teachers and if you've got students with you and that type of thing too, uh, just to, to help teach and um, educate more uh, about the really important stuff when it comes to uh, medications there. Uh, if you enjoy the show, leave us a rating, review on iTunes. Uh, and I, sorry, I forgot to mention that PDF, uh, absolutely free to you. Uh, for subscribing to the uh, blog and getting updates when we've got uh, new podcasts or new things coming out. So uh, go check that out at reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, support our sponsor, meded101.com slash store. And leave us a rating review if you love the show, you enjoy listening, and you've learned uh, a few pearls here and there. So take care. Thanks for listening, and have a great rest of your day.